All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 18th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2024. <clears throat> I fully expected to wake up this morning to the news that Israel had launched a massive invasion on, of Lebanon. I wasn't there. I'll talk about that later. First of all, I want to talk about uh, something else. I've been speaking a lot lately about uh, the institutional church or civilizational Christianity, Roman Catholicism. Well, constant, uh, all kind of goes back formally to, to form as a formal sense to Constantine, and Constantine uh, uh, committing fornication with the church. The church was already had sufficient lust for the world at that time. And, and Satan waits for an opportune moment, but I, I'm convinced that Constantine, uh, whether you believe it was his motive or not, you wanted to use Christianity for his own political purposes and to glue the empire together. Because the Roman Empire was unstable. It was a mess. It always was a mess. Uh, it's like the United States. The United States has no glue either. And like the United States, it was composed, it was an empire compo composed of diverse cultures and languages and everything else. It had no unity other than the Roman legions, which were also from all over the place. So, and, and they were often the source of overthrowing an empire, an emperor, and bringing somebody else in. And yeah, it was a mess. But the church corrupted itself, or a portion of the church. Uh, Constantine wanted unity in the church because he wanted the glue. I mean, you look at the evidence, does the, the evidence support your theses or oppose it? Well, my thesis is he used it like all politicians use religion for political purposes, for their own political purposes. Yeah, that's we all know that. We, I hope Christians understand that. Christians don't really understand how the world works, apparently. But anyway, that's to be expected. Uh, sinners are by nature self-interested. That is the fall. Self, dominated by self because God's not in you, which is why you must be born from above, born again, born of the Spirit. Spirit of God, because that which is, as Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh. You are of Adam, cut off from God, alienated from God, dead in trespasses and sins, on your way to the grave, separated from God. And that's why <coughs> Jesus came. The most momentous event in all of time. Is Christ dying on the cross for sinners? God revealing his true nature, which isn't truly revealed in the law of Moses. As John says in his gospel, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Came to be. Now, he, is, uh, he is God's answer to the fall. He is the second Adam. He is the restoration of all things. He is also the creator. He came to fix the mess and to reveal something greater. The ultimate purpose of God in creating man, again, was let us make man in our own image. Man was to be the image of God. 
And when Paul in Romans 1 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that's what he's referring to. We are supposed to be the image of God. We are supposed to be an exact likeness of God. We are supposed to be God's presence in creation. Doesn't mean we are God, but we are supposed to be intimately connected with God, just like Jesus Christ was, who is the firstborn of many brethren. That's God's purpose. That's his purpose, been his purpose since Jesus' death and resurrection and, and then the outpouring at Pentecost is to send the gospel into all the world and invite sinners to come to him, to draw sinners to him, to God's salvation that he prepared on the cross in Christ. That's a purpose. That is the purpose. God's purpose to fix the mess that Satan and Adam caused. Yeah. God was not God said, let us make man in our image. It it when Adam died, I don't think he was they were fully mature anyway. Uh, there were two trees in the garden that are mentioned in the scripture. Sure, there's, there was lots of trees but uh, that were food to eat. But there was the, the tree of the, the forbidden tree of, actually, it's experiential knowledge of good and evil. The experience of good and evil. Knowing something from experience, not in the abstract. Ah, that was, don't eat of that tree, because the day you do, you shall die. God had a purpose in planting it there. But there was another tree that was not forbidden until after they had sinned. That was the tree of life. They could eat of that tree and live forever. We don't know all the details, because they didn't eat of that tree. They chose the forbidden tree and brought death not only on themselves, but on all their offspring. Adam, through the sin of one man, death came to all mankind. We all spring forth from him. There was, there was nothing after, nothing there to be born of out of Adam but flesh. Uh, which, in the, when Paul uses the word flesh, he's referring to that which comes from fallen Adam, that we're born into naturally. That's why Jesus said, "You must be born." of the flesh, and then of the spirit, of the water and the spirit, of the flesh and the spirit, water corresponding to flesh. What happens when a person is born naturally? What's the first thing that's born? Comes forth, water. Right? All you fathers and mothers know that from first-hand experience or second-hand experience. Well, actually, it's first-hand, too, because we're usually there at the time. And uh, I don't. well, that was that was when men and women actually married back in the the dark ages, right? First time it's a little bit panicky. Second time, ah, eh, we've been through this before. You know what to expect from experience. Okay, so what I was wanted to say was uh, talking about the uh, uh, the institutional church that you, we can sort of label it as, as starting with Constantine. It's not a perfect description, but uh, it, it's a marker. It's a marker. Uh, it sort of began the formal process of converting it into the state church. It was he actually did make it a state church began paying the salaries of the clergy. He began building church buildings, uh, building the biggest churches in, in what would become Christendom. And then a couple emperors later, it was the only lawful religion in the empire. But uh, at the time, it was, you know, the, the Council of Nicaea was to settle a disagreement inside the church because Constantine wanted unity because that was what he wanted to use it for. Uh, so that, but you, uh, civilization, let's call it civilizational Christianity. 
uh, or establishment. You know, the, the establishment of religion in the Constitution refers to a state church. You have one established denomination, like the Church of England. So, but a state church or civilizational Christianity, but especially a state church because it's tied up in loyalty to the state and citizenship, too. Uh, let me check. My, my wife is sending me a message. Okay. Important message, but status update. Uh, but there, there's, I wanted to point out that the true church, the spiritual church, those who are born again of the Spirit, those who are called by God, regenerated by God, and we are uh, the body of Christ. We, he is our Lord. We belong to him personally. The only kind of real Christianity there is, Jesus said, in order to see the kingdom of God, to perceive it, or to enter it, you must be born again. Well, that's coming, you, you come to Christ and believe in, in Christ by faith and confess Christ. And But what's what God does, he draws you, uh, he convicts you, uh, he regenerates you, and he saves you. So we look at it from the human side or from, from God's side. Now, that's the true church. All those who truly belong to Christ were his body. And the institutional church or the civilizational Christianity or, you know, the stuff that Constantine built, which was already in the works, by the way. <clears throat> it was just this growing establishment, growing hierarchy, uh, special priesthood, sacramentalism took over, uh, it was because those are things man can see and touch and control. The true church was invisible because Christ is currently invisible. That's why you have to be born again. You can't perceive it unless you're born again. The world can't perceive the church, the, the true church. They don't have the eyes for it. Christians, we do see it. Born again Christians. Natural Christians, those that are made Christians by baptism and whatever, uh, that haven't been made that by God can't. So there's a huge division in what's called the church. Where you remember the old Venn diagrams from sixth grade or whenever they did that, where they they had over like you're talking about logic, logic. It was really logic of, of uh, overlap. You have that and or 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 exclusive kind of stuff. <clears throat> Introduction to to elementary logic, I suppose it is. But if you had a Venn diagram of the church, the natural church and the supernatural church, they, they overlap to a considerable degree. Unfortunately, they're not equal in scale. The, the, the natural church the, uh, that's of the world, the church that man built, is much, much larger than the supernatural church, I think. I, I can't count it, but... But it's of the world, uh, and it's natural, and it's, you know, there, Jesus said the way, his way, the way to, to life is narrow, and few find it. You have to want to find it. So, uh, but the, uh, the point, uh, there is, they, they do, they tend to overlap to a large degree. I suspect that most born-again Christians, especially in the West uh, and much of the East, uh, China might be an exception to a, to a more of a degree than other places uh, where the church is openly persecuted and there was by the state because you have a, a break in opposition there and it becomes very uncomfortable to be a Christian and you don't do it unless you're a real Christian generally some people do but for other reasons but so but they they tend like in the United States and the West, although it, it's they're pulling apart now. Uh, uh, the United States was really the beginning of the deinstitutionalizing of the state, of uh, the establishment of religion in general. Uh, it was a re rebellion against uh, civilizational Christianity. But there's there's a lot of confusion. This is very confusing for Christians because. 
In fact, I think that's Satan's purpose in it is to confuse us. Because when you're persecuted, like if you're a Christian in the old Soviet Union or in North Korea or someplace like that, generally, I think Christians in North Korea are going to be much better off now that there's a certain degree of alliance with Christian Russia. So Korea, there, there, there's, a, there's an incentive in North Korea and in China to, to not mistreat Christians because Russia historically and this, to this day, and uh, Vladimir Putin is a practicing Russian Orthodox believer. Whether he's born again, I don't know. But the, his position there, historically, Russia has been a uh, protector of Christians in general, just like uh, their, their uh, special military operation in Ukraine was to protect the Russians, the ethnic Russians and the Russian speaking and the Russian culture in that part of Ukraine, which was not historically part of Ukraine at all. Uh, it's part of New Russia. See, if you look at a little history, you'll find out Ukraine is like Poland. It, it's sort of a an apparition that comes and goes and changes shape and everything else. So, uh, but, so you have um, the, the Ukrainian, the government of, what's his name? Zelensky, came into office promising peace. And what does he do? Immediately he begins launching a civil war against the Donbass, which was historically Russian, just like Crimea. You know, that whole area there was, uh, all of what's called Ukraine was, became, uh, a lot of it became, uh, the, uh, let me say, the Crimea was historically Russian, going way back to like Catherine the Great or something like that. And it was never part of Ukraine. But Khrushchev, probably for administrative purposes and political purposes, transfer, uh, transferred the uh, Crimea to the jurisdiction of Ukraine, which was a under the Soviet Union. So it was like taking a, one piece of territory that was uh, in dispute of one state and uh, putting it in another state for practical purposes, perhaps. Uh, but there, it was, you know, 1958, I think, is when that happened. So. In other words, Crimea being part of uh, Ukraine doesn't predate me. I date back farther than 1958. So. Okay, so, but there's this overlap between real Christianity, born-again Christianity, uh, with Christians that are God's handiwork, and uh, we could say natural Christians uh, that are civilizational Christians or traditional Christians or whatever. Something else has made them Christians. Uh, so there, there's a large overlap. So there's a lot of people that are in that are born again Christians and are in an institutional church too, and that causes a lot of confusion. <laughs> it does, and there's there's persecution if it, because you won't fit in if you're a real born again Christian. You just don't fit. You don't fit. It's like when I tried to go back to my home church, where the church I was baptized and confirmed in, when I got out of the Air Force, it's like, no, I couldn't. I couldn't because they resisted me. You know, I go there, you try to help, you try to do things, you do this and that, and they, and, and they know. Because they know that, that there's something, there's a, a barrier between you and everybody else that isn't born again. There, there's a, a separation. You're, you're different, of a different kingdom. You have a different spirit. They're of the world. In this case, they were of the world. Not that there weren't some there, but the leadership and everything was of the world. I remember the... Uh, uh, at that time, the uh, that denomination was trying to 
indoctrinate the congregations in, into accepting homosexuality in the church. They finally achieved that. Of course, a lot of Christians, every, every real Christian bailed out. I had a terrible time getting my parents to leave that abomination, the ELCA, by the way. And, you know, the last time I checked on them at one of their conventions on YouTube, it was the rainbow stole women warriors were in charge of everything. But, yeah, they were, they were spiritually dead. I went to one of their, when I tried going back there, I went to one of their, uh, their International Missions Association meetings. Uh, they had it out in Fargo, North Dakota, I think it was. and Or it might have been right across the river. And, um, no, it was in Fargo. Because they had a camp a school out there. But it was completely dead. The, the whole theme of the, the missions conference was listening to Muslims. Not speaking the gospel to Muslims, listening to them. And just to prove there are saints, even in the darkest places. There's an old woman there. I've told this story before. And you break up into, uh, you know, these smaller groups on different subjects. And he was recounting his experiences. This is one of the leaders of the, the missionary movement. Missionary. Their idea of missions is drilling a water well someplace. Uh, but he was recounting his experience, I think, in the Philippines or someplace down in that area uh, with a lot of Muslims. It might have been... Uh, Malaysia or any place down there and uh, there was a Muslim uh, who wanted to convert to Christianity and he tried to talk him out of becoming a Christian and this old lady I mean she was well into her 80s at that time which was a few years ago and I, I was still a young man <laughs> and and I was there, and I was just, and starting to resist it. And she stood up. Turns out she was a retired missionary back when that those, some of those Lutherans were actually Christians. And she took a bony finger and began to wag it at that man. Young man, what these people need is Jesus Christ. And I was like, in love, my sister. Yeah, I hung around with her the rest of the time I was there, like, Oh, no, that's, there's, there's light in dark places, and light attracts light. That's, so, uh, but there are, there's, a, there's an overlap, and it's very confusing. Um, see, the, the cultural Christianity is all concerned about the world. Uh, cultural Christianity today is all concerned about who's going to be elected president. Real Christians, we don't have to be concerned. Christians have lived under every government under the sky, you know, and still today, uh, there's, there's, you know, who knows how many Christians there are in, in China. Uh, there's Christians in North Korea, Christians everywhere. Christians in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Christians in Iran, growing Christian numbers of Christians in Iran. Uh, sometimes on the, on the, on the YouTube uh, exaggeration network, uh, People say, oh, it's becoming Christian. There's a million followers of Christ. Well, yeah, but there's 65 million people in the country. So let's keep a perspective on things. It hasn't become Christian. Yeah, but it'll never it'll never be majority Christian, real Christian. And what kind of Christians are they becoming? Probably in Iran, you're going to see more of the real Christians because you don't, if you're under in a country that, that is hostile toward Christianity, growing in the United States too, uh, unless you've been saved by God, you're not going to say, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me up that hill and die with me. And he said, unless you're willing to do that, you can't be my disciple. You got you to love him or anything else. Or you'll fall away. And so, but in the world's Christianity, it ain't so tough. But in so in places like Iran, uh, I don't think Christians have been persecuted terribly there. Uh, China, well, there's groups that get it worse. Christians, it's been difficult in China, especially under Mao. But uh, and it's, it's the Chinese 
government anything that that separates your loyalty from the state is basically the issue there and so they're more concerned about like Roman Catholicism in China uh, they have a state Christian denomination uh, the three self movement uh, so you know but real Christians don't hang around it they, they meet in house churches which can get your house bulldozed um, there's persecution uh, but Christians we can get around it we, we've lived under that for, for 2,000 years at times where it's difficult at times where it's not so difficult and where it's easy is sometimes the worst. Uh, the Christians behind what we used to call the uh, the Iron Curtain. <laughs> it's coming back. It's just facing the other direction now. Uh, but uh, they used to pray. Because I, I used to be involved in some of these mission groups that, that were bringing scriptures in, seeking to bring scriptures behind the Iron Curtain because you couldn't get a hold of Bibles and stuff. Uh, the stories of, of Christian churches in, in these countries, people would go visit, uh, praying for the United States, because they realize that, that we're in more danger than they are, because there isn't the, uh, the hostility, open hostility, so the temptation, the seduction of the world is a problem in the West. Now we're getting more of the hostility. So it's like, make your choice. You want to go with the alphabet soup or you want to go with Christ? Just to mention one problem, that's tribulation. We're under pressure in the West as probably as much as and more than in many other places to conform to the world to a radically anti-Christ, anti-God vision. In some ways, it'd be easier for Christians to live in a Muslim country than to live in the United States. And we actually have more in common with Muslims than we have in with uh, many Americans. We can understand each other. We should be able to understand each other. They claim they are not pagans. I want to make this clear again. They are worshipers of the God of Abraham. They just don't have a clear revelation of that God in the Quran. The Quran is, and the Jewish Talmud, by the way, is severely lacking in two things, well, I'd say at least two things. One, the knowledge of the sinfulness of humanity and the knowledge of salvation. See, the first necessary informs you, uh, the first diagnoses the problem, and the second is the cure. Christ crucified is a cure. And that, they, think it's, it's, they think that's foolishness. I mean, both Jews and, Greek, Jews and Muslims. Uh, Muslims deny that Christ himself was actually crucified. They, they do believe that he was perhaps the greatest prophet. Uh, they believe he's coming again. They believe lots of things about him. They believe he was born of Mary. They, uh, but the revelation of Jesus in the Quran is, Isa in the Quran is deficient. Uh, and the revelation of God in the Quran is deficient. But it is the God, it's, it's like, uh, the uh, Samaritans. You remember Jesus went to the woman from Samaria at the well. And he said that you worship what you do not know. That we worship what we do know, in other words, because salvation is of the Jews. Uh, the Jews worshipped God. They had a, a revelation of God, a true revelation of God, where the Samaritans, not so much. They had a version of the Pentateuch, 
and they were still practicing animal sacrifice and stuff. So, they, of course, the Jews were in Jesus' day, too. But they didn't accept the prophets. Um, it was a little bit of a mix, but the Jews generally did recognize them as non-pagans, just like half-Jews. <laughs> So, but we, we have a lot of that in the church, and again, it, it, per, uh, perse persecution has always purified and strengthened the church. Uh, when the when the when when we're under times of prosperity and acceptance, the church gets polluted because lots of people join it for the wrong reason. Spiritually polluted, so it's a lot of confusion. And again, like in this election, but we don't have to worry about who's, you know, it's who cares? Christ is king. He's our God. We are not of this world. The, the, all these things, uh, which, which uh, unregenerate human being is going to be president of the United States. Satan only puts his children in power anyway, so. <laughs> That's of the world. The United States is of the world. It's not of God. It's of the world. All these things about, you know, these legends we hear. And some of these hymns that are in our hymnals, they're abominable idolatry, some of them. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Of thee, my country, I say. No! We got American flags, usually especially Protestant churches, an American flag up in front. And some of them are so bad, I do not dare go to what you would think of as, as a, a, a conservative Christian church anytime around the 4th of July, lest the congregation stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Not giving a thought to what Christ might think of that. You cannot give your allegiance to two people or two entities. If your allegiance, you've been bought with a price, if you're a Christian born again, with the blood of Jesus, you're, you're, you're his property. You're not free to sell yourself to another. You're his. You're espoused to him. So why are you going dilly-dallying around with the world? It doesn't matter. You don't know God's purposes. Maybe God wants persecution in America to purify his church, to make a distinction between what is true and what is false. Let the world be the world, but let the church be the church. And then let the world see the difference. There's people, fairly famous people, that, that are coming to a form of Christianity, but it's civilizational. Because they're, they're, they see the civilization, well, going, you know where. They're already there, but, it's, but so they see the collapse, and they're concerned about that. So they, they, they're looking at Christianity as maybe an antidote. But it's for the same reason Constantine did. But that's not the real thing. Real Christians are Christians through a personal relationship with Christ that God initiates. You're his workmanship, created in Christ onto good works. That, that's the fruit that comes from that God changes us, but leaves us in these sinful bodies for good reasons <laughs> that I want to talk about, but so uh, anyway, back to what I started with. Uh, yesterday, I, I heard about the, the Israeli terror attack uh, on Lebanon with the exploding pagers. And yeah, they haven't admitted it. So what? We all know it was Israel. They've done this stuff before. You know, explosives and cell phones. Uh, you'd call the guy's number and then you'd say goodbye. Bam. And his head goes off. Uh, we know they've done that. So I was, you know, I, I thought this, and so I saw this, and I bet Israel is going to launch launch their attack on Lebanon that they've been talking about for 
months now. And this is a prelude to it, because if you're going to launch a strike in another country, one of the things you want to take out is command and control. You want to disrupt their communication system, cause, cause confusion, uh, the, the prep for D-Day. There's all kinds of uh, fake stuff and, and feigned attacks, and some of the paratroopers were actually plastic dummies that had uh, firecracker charges, you know, sounded like rifle shots attached to them, you know, deceptive to confuse people about what's going on. And so one of the, and you want to take out their, their command centers and disrupt their communications links so they, they, they can't coordinate. Well, I don't think that would necessarily be that effective against Hezbollah because Hezbollah is a different kind of organization. It's a different kind of thing. It is a, it is a movement. It, it's not a, her, uh, a terrorist organization. Either. I don't care what the federal government says. I don't listen to anything they say because it's all lies. A lot of us have seen that. But, see, that's what they want us to believe. So if they want you to believe something, go search it out for yourself. It's, it's a, it is, it's a, real, in Islam, there is no distinction between go, state and, and church. It's, it's all one thing. It's, it's a civilizational thing. Uh, so Hezbollah is, uh, all kinds of community activities. It is charity. It is health care. Uh, same, same as Hamas in Gaza. Different organizations, different religions, and one's Sunni and one's Shia, uh, Hezbollah Shia, uh, but they're not quite at war anymore. <laughs> Iran and Saudi Arabia sort of patch things up. But uh, there, there are some differences there. <laughs> but it's, it's a historic thing. It's not fundamental differences, really. Um, but it's, 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 it's so the, 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 it's a system, it's a movement that encompasses everything. And they're a political party. I think Hezbollah really means that it's translated in English is the party of God. So they have all these other activities they're involved in, just like Hamas is, does in, in Gaza. They're actually the government in Gaza. And Hezbollah really has never practiced terrorism. They practice resistance. The United States has practiced a lot more terrorism than they did. In fact, in the American Revolution, there's a lot of terrorism that was involved on both sides. Uh, and deception. But Hezbollah, especially uh, in recent history, has been quite discriminating in what they deliberately target. They don't target civilians, unlike Ukraine and unlike the United States and unlike Israel. Hamas does not deliberately attack civilians. Islam has a certain amount of honor to it, uh, in spite of everything that's been spoken against uh, Muhammad. But some of that is like, so you can't apply American values, whatever those are, to, uh, what is it, 7th century Arabia? You know, a lot of the criticism is just to uh, incite Westerners and Americans against certain things. So... You know, it's you have to you have to put on your seventh century glasses. Just like the ideas in the Quran about Christianity. Well, Muhammad was a traitor um, on caravans, and there was Christianity in Arabia, and there was Judaism in Arabia, and a lot of the ideas in the Quran match with contemporary religion of that time. Christianity in the 7th century was... It was really low. It was in, in idolatry and everything else. The worship of Mary was pretty much full steam. Uh, that, 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 see, because that civilizational Christianity has no reality. It's, it's just tradition. And 
uh, sinful humanity wants tangible things. So sinful humanity wants something, a, a god or goddess that they can see and touch and worship. They don't want something invisible. That's why sacramentalism came to the fore even earlier, because it's tangible. It's like God giving visual aids, things you can see, and it's, uh, because we have physical uh, senses. Uh, it, the power is not in the visible. The power is in God himself. So the water doesn't do anything. It's just a sign for us. Uh, the bread and the wine are just do this in remembrance of me. They're talking about the Passover more than anything. The, the true meaning of the Passover is in Christ. It's not about the bread being transubstantiated, which is uh, uh, Aristotelian nonsense anyway. Intra See, that's bringing theology, a certain amount of theology is bringing pagan ideas into the church. Because the world loved it. I mean, a lot of the so-called church fathers were pagan philosophers, and they just didn't just dump that stuff. They brought it in, often, to varying degrees. Uh, so that, that's where a lot of the confusion and the weakness in the church today is, is even born-again Christians. First of all, you don't know what it means to be a Christian. Most people don't. And those that do, we find ourselves square pegs in round holes. We just don't fit. So we experience uh, rejection by the uh, established church, just par for the course. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Jesus revolution, uh, that period of time when the Holy Spirit was calling young people that were disillusioned with the world, disillusioned with prosperity, had realized there had to be something more to life than stuff to one degree or another, and said, hey, how about this? We're looking for reality. And it had nothing to do with churches. I mean, the, the, that movie they've got out now, I'm sure it's about Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel and Lonnie Frisbee, who was never, apparently never a real Christian he, uh, because he died of AIDS, had a long life of of, uh, he, he never uh, manifested a change in uh, true repentance. God wrought repentance. Not that a Christian becomes sinless, but uh, you, you can't, if you live a lifestyle that is completely contrary to what God says, you, the Holy Spirit, God, the Father, disciplines every child he receives. He, you can't get away with this stuff. <laughs> I mean, you, can't, he, he, you will be miserable. As a born-again Christian, uh, you go out and indulge yourself in your old sins, and you will be miserable. It just doesn't taste like it used to, you know. Uh, and and you get you find yourself in bondage to it again because you've been walking where you shouldn't walk, and 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 you will uh, you just can't you can't delight in that anymore because your attitude towards sin, what you once loved, you now hate. And if, if that doesn't show. Uh, if you still love the world and the things of the world, as uh, the Apostle said, the love of the Father is not in you. You haven't been born again. God hasn't changed your heart. But it, it's very confusing, though, because all these people, are, this is supposed to be the church, but uh, see, but it, it, it was for confusing for the institutional church, too, the Jesus revolution. means where, where are all these crazy young people that, that love Jesus? They want to talk about Jesus all the time. It's all about Jesus. All they want to do is talk about Jesus. We can't stand them. Yeah. He was the focus. He's the Savior. To say the least. Uh, and it was confusing for the, for, the, for the institutional church. Confusing for my family. It's like I was raised as a Lutheran, which is which is what's rapidly becoming paganism. Now that that denomination now is just pagan, essentially. I mean, it's, it, what is it? It's just a a shadow of times past. There's no reality in it at all. There was little in it when when I was, you know, growing up in it. It was it was we weren't you know we, we fit into the world. 
See, if you fit into the world, if you fit comfortably into this world, you can pretty much gamble or bet that you're not a born-again Christian. So, but uh, back to the, the pager deal, the terrorist act by Israel, which is because it's indiscriminate. Uh, it was immediately apparent to me that they had put explosive charges in these pagers. Uh, Hezbollah, Nasrallah told Hezbollah to get rid of their smartphones because Israel knows how to track them and use uh, a smartphone as a spy device. This thing here is essentially, essentially a spy device. I mean, uh, they sell it, market it for all kinds of things, but, you know, when they put GPS in phones... It's supposedly for our good, right? So if we're out uh, in the wilderness and uh, where the phone don't, doesn't work anyway and something happens, we can, we can call 911. Well, yeah, so. But a lot of these things have another purpose, too. And if they can be used for something else, like tracking your location by the state, the government, well, they'll do it. So these essentially, and because these are... Uh, uh, the product of for-profit enterprises, they would be the, the desire to make money off you by by stealing all your information, either for targeting ads or to sell it to some. You're in the slave market out there for sale every day. Uh, these are a spy device, a, a information gathering device, which is not what you bought it for, right? See, we may think we're free, but we're not. And one of the worst things, this is a this is a fascist country today. Fascism is when you have a partnership between big corporations and and government. It's not conducted in your your personal interest. This is all these, you know, you got GPS, but who allows it to be used for other purposes? I mean, you can disable some of the stuff supposedly. But they can, you know, the, 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 the people that actually created the phones, they know how to work around that stuff. And those that they are in cahoots with. Uh, this happens to be an Apple phone. I had to get a new one because I dropped my old one. And I tried using the Android, and it's like, this thing is, is like five times worse as far as invasive advertising. So I said, no. I'll have to bite the bullet and get a... Apple's at least not so bad. Uh, but, uh, again, it's like went Microsoft. They, they are, all these things, they've sold their soul because capitalism is all about making profit in the world. They have no other motives than self. So the, the strive for profit and increase is the um, greed is the driving power of capitalism. Socialism doesn't work because it's basically a ripoff of Christianity. Love your neighbor as yourself. It was like secular Christianity, you know, Christian morals without uh, Christ. Well, it doesn't work. Uh, you can't have selfish, self-centered people just don't work good in a, in a uh, commune. <laughs> Christians could. I mean, they're, I mean, like like the, the Soviet collective, you know, a collective farm. Like Christians, we can, we can actually work for others out of a godly, uh, the, the spirit of God of love, loving for one, love for one another. See, Christians would fit into that better. But those that are not born again, they can't. They 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 operate out of self interest. And capitalism is like unrestrained sin, just like sin on steroids. So it's, it's very destructive. That's what happened. The businesses, they they do things that that are uh, they know are wrong because they don't like it being done to themselves. That's how they demonstrate they they know that it's a wrong thing. But back to the the, the pagers. Now, pagers, they're a simple device, they're a receiver, they're not a transmitter. This transmits data all the time. 
It can be interrogated at will unless it's unless you pull the battery out. You can't do that on an Apple. You can put it in a you can wrap it up in aluminum foil. <laughs> that won't that won't function. But I can't receive or transmit that. But but that's why Israel is just evil. Uh, and the United States developed the, the technology for using people's cell phones against them before that. <clears throat> but Israel, you know, assassinated people with that. Uh, Israel, Israel and terrorism, let me say, Zionism, the Zionist movement, because that's what we're talking about with the state of Israel. This, uh, not all Jews, including Jews in Israel, the, the, the Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel do not believe the Israeli government is legitimate, and they're opposed to to the Zionism and stealing people's lands. So I want to make that distinction. The, the Zionist movement, which uh, hurt Solo and those guys, they were secularists. They were basically atheists. Uh, they used, uh, they began in the 19th, 20th century, even late 19th, to buy up land where they could in Palestine and then after uh, the the uh, Israel came, uh, the Palestine came under British occupation, and then the League of Nations mandated uh, Britain. You know, the Sykes Pico, the French and the English divided the Middle East between themselves. Uh, <clears throat> then. Britain, because of the uh, what was the Balfour De Declaration, was permitting Zionists to immigrate to Israel or Palestine, and they were there was a Jewish fund. It was, you know, they began to be able to buy up more land, not much, but still considerably more. And then uh, when there was grumbling among the Arabs and unrest among the Arabs about this, all these invaders from Europe coming in and buying up property. The Brits began to cut back on Jewish immigration, and uh, then the Jews began to engage in terrorism, not only against the Arabs to drive them out of land, but terrorism against the British government. Uh, uh, you had Haganah, and who was the other more radical group that, uh, uh, oh, what was the prime minister's name uh, that actually made peace with Egypt? He was a member of the, a radical group that bombed the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. And so the, 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 the Zionists were engaged in, uh, uh, they had their militias, and they were engaged in terrorist activities against not only the 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 inhabitants of the land, but against the the British to drive the British out. And they got their way in 1948. Uh, there was widespread terrorism and genocide being committed against uh, that. But we're in the West. I mean, Hollywood's made a number of movies that glorify. Uh, the 1948 war, the, the Israelis' war for, quote, independence. And the, Hollywood has never made a pro-Palestinian movie that I know of. Just like, think of all the, the Hollywood movies uh, about uh, cowboys and Indians and uh, the cavalry riding to the rescue. and They didn't do any movies on the Sand Creek Massacre or a lot of stuff. It's the, so you've got the corporations whitewashing the government acts because, well, basically because of profit. Uh, people want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear, you know, you're, you're in public school, you're indoctrinated into the glories of America, and America's the greatest country in the world, and America's the, the longest existing democracy in the world, which is a bunch of bunk. It's bunk. Not even a democracy. It's always been a plutocracy or something. I mean, all the founding fathers. Which one was the poor man? He had rich people in power. They wanted the revolution. It was in their financial interest. 
There's all kinds of economic motives and other motives by many people. Lust for other people's land was one of them. But the culture, because we want to hear and reinforce what we've already been taught and believe, the culture just, you know, the Hollywood just feeds that because it makes them money. It's like the news media. It didn't have to censor itself. It, it all it because it it looks to what most people want to hear and provides that because that helps them make money. See, capitalism is a very dangerous system. It isn't about truth. It isn't about God. It's about feeding sin. It lives off human sinfulness. Adam Smith glorified greed. The unseen hand. Well, it might work. Well, so do explosive cell phones or explosive pagers. So what, apparently, back to the pagers. So it, the, what was confusing me, so I fully expected to wake up to the news of a massive Israeli invasion of Lebanon again. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. This is confusing. Why? Because this is taking out command and control. This is a one-shot deal. They went to a lot of trouble to do this. This was a major project. So it's not just a gimmick in some department. This was a major product project. And this is a, a way to take out command and control and cause, cause confusion uh, in Hezbollah, especially among the leadership. Now, it won't really enter at, at the local level because this is a different kind of organization. It's more like a guerrilla type movement. All the local units already know what they're supposed to be doing, resisting Israel, and they're going to do it regardless of whether they can get orders from on high or not because they're, they're followers of Allah. They're, they're members of Hezbollah. They, they know the enemy. That's re, the, the purpose is to resist Israel. So they're not going to be... They know, they know what they're going to do. They don't have to have orders. They know what their, their purpose is. Uh, they're Muslims. They know what their purpose is. So they have, uh, it's not going to be a terribly effective thing. Now, Americans, like, well, I don't know what we're going to do. We've got to wait for orders. Well, they don't have to wait for orders, especially if something's gone blank. But this is a one-shot deal. So Israel had this, this ace in the hole that they went to a lot of trouble of doing it. They went to a lot of trouble to, to, to either intercept or get uh, the, uh, who was it? The, the company in Taiwan that the, um, something golden, I think, uh, that the, uh, they're supposed to be the manufacturer, didn't actually manufacture these. They, uh, leased or sold their trademark and to another firm in Europe that wanted to make uh, pagers and use their trademark. And they did it. Love of money. Capitalism. And I suspect that company was probably a front for Mossad or a con conglomerate of deep state actors. Who knows? So they went to an awful lot of trouble to, to plant these uh, or intercepted a shipment and modified them, and, but that's more difficult. Setting up a front company and using somebody else's trademark is not hard. Israel knows how to bribe and deceive uh, and to kill and blackmail. What do you think Epstein's Island was all about? Doesn't, doesn't take more than a couple brain cells to rub together to connect those dots. A little poking around. Ha-ha! Uh, I thought so. So, but why, if, if there hasn't, there still could be a major uh, invasion, but this is something you do right before or right when you're starting. So when I woke up, and there was nothing. What's going on? 
I began to think. Hmm. Possibility. The thing was going to be discovered, so they used it before the word got around to get rid of your pagers. That's possible, to save it. But it, this is just terrorism. What? Are they, are they, or possibly to provoke Hezbollah. But if that was, if it was just to provoke them, well, there's all kinds of ways to do that. Why would you lose your ace in the hole? Which is obviously designed to disrupt command and control if you decide to go in. Because that's the only reason to do it. That's what it's for. I mean, you don't have to have a big military background to figure that out. Just little reason. So, and you wouldn't blow it on just, well, don't we just gonna show you what we can do to you? No, that all that effort's wasted. I mean, you can just drop a 2,000-pound bomb on some apartment building. You're, well, you've done a lot of that. They're always doing things like that. Okay, so what's going on? I was thinking, okay, what, what, could, what could make sense here? Assuming, because uh, the, the disruption in command and control is very, a very temporary effect. And there's no invasion yet, as far as I know. What's going on? Again, it could have been almost going to be discovered, and they decided to, well, might as well use it now. We'll just injure some people, just for fun. Uh, Israel's either completely lost, could have completely lost their mind. Mm, not going to discount that possibility. There's something else occurred to me. This is all speculation. I know nothing. I have no special insight, I mean, of this world. I don't have any contacts in this world. But I do understand how the world works. Scripture reveals that to us. What else could be going on? Because this should have been the prelude to a major invasion. This, otherwise, it'd be like, the Allies dropping the parachutes with the dummies on just for fun three months before the invasion. Wouldn't make any sense, would it? Okay. They have a purpose. Those pagered had a particular purpose and they went to a lot of trouble to do it. And the purpose is to disrupt command and control. It's not targeting a specific individuals. It was rather indiscriminate because they killed at least one child. What did a lot of other people that had nothing to do with it? I mean, you're just, just putting explosives in pagers. So you send them a, spe a special sequence of messages or something and there's a little decoder card in there that's wired to an explosive charge, and bang! Israelis done things like this before, but this was on a broad scale. So, if there isn't an invasion in works, again, it'd be a little, you know, you want to do it right when you begin going in to sow the maximum confusion. It's like the parachute dummies were dropped simultaneously with the the actual uh, airborne units coming in by parachute. So they'd, you know, they, they'd be, the Germans would be all confused. What's going on? Here we got dummies and there we got people with guns. I mean, what's going on here? It's just so confusion. So they don't know what's going on. Um, again, it could have been almost discoverable, so we might as well just use it and just as a terrorist attack. But what's the, there's another possibility, assuming that the, the invasion's not on right now. 
what if it's almost civil war inside the Israeli government? What if it's the military? What if Netanyahu was indeed going to use the, the Israeli military to invade Lebanon, and the Israeli military doesn't want to invade Lebanon because they can't even win in Gaza, and Hezbollah is a much more powerful force. And what if some people with, with uh, half a brain in the, in the military decided to sabotage Netanyahu's invasion orders of Lebanon? Just a couple days ago, there was uh, publicly Netanyahu uh, called on the military to prepare themselves for imminent uh, action in Lebanon. What if the military, or a branch of the military, the ones that control the, the uh, uh, pagers, decided to, to sabotage that by using the ace in the hole card so Netanyahu couldn't do it? This is internal sabotage, perhaps. Does that make any sense? Because we already know there's a conflict between the military and the Netanyahu administration regime. They don't want it. They don't want to invade Lebanon. Uh, Netanyahu is already forcing them into the West Bank. They don't want that. The military's already got hammered in Gaza. We don't even know because they're censoring the casualty reports. But we know that Gaza, in Gaza, uh, Israel doesn't come out and walk down the street and open. They're getting hammered all the time. I mean, uh, Hamas makes their own weapons. They make anti-tank weapons, rockets, and 50 caliber sniper rifles. A soldier getting shot by a 50 cal your armor doesn't do a dang thing except create big pieces to go in the hole. You can't carry enough armor to keep a 50 cal from going through you. That's why they stay in their tanks. And then somebody, some kid with a hand-carried mine runs up and clamps it on the, sticks it to a magnetic mine, sticks it to the back door and blows the tank out. Or their double charred, charged handmade uh, rifles, or uh, uh, RPGs. I don't, they, they make, I don't know how much damage they actually do because we don't see that, but Israel was complaining they're running out of tanks. They run out of men. Israelis don't want to be there. Because it's very dangerous and very stressful. And the Israeli soldiers are not well trained. There's plenty of videos on the internet all the time put out where you see the Israelis gathering in groups and doing all kinds of stupid things that, that any, any soldier that's had a couple months of training, it would say, no, you don't do that. Or this just, just things are stupid. It's utterly stupid. Sticking their, their rifles out windows to be spotted? See, you have to understand, a rifle 500 yards is like nothing. Doesn't that be a 50 cal? I know how accurate rifles can be at 500 yards. I've got some paper targets to show it. But I only shoot paper. It's a, it's a technical problem for me. Just a challenge, you know.
And I've already, okay, <laughs> I don't need to do that anymore. Just to see what you can do. I suppose it's like golf. But it's, I mean, it's, it's nothing. I, I, anybody, you don't have to have a whole lot of training. You don't have to go through Marine Sniper School. All it is is a matter of putting the crosshair on the right thing, understanding your ballistics, and doing a careful trigger squeeze. That's it. Properly holding everything. Headshot at 500 yards, nothing. Under the right conditions. Yeah, when there's people shooting back at you, it's, your your heart rate's probably going a little bit faster, and that creates problems. But the Israeli shoulders are as dumb as stones. Like the Americans in Vietnam out there drinking beer and smoking dope and hiding in their bunkers. Of course, they don't want to be there either. That was a useless war. America was on the wrong side of that. It's just doing evil, just killing people. For what end? The Vietnamese people won. If we had helped the Vietnamese gain their independence from the French, it might have been a different story. But when you're interested in your own power and maintaining power and dominion over others, everything you do is going to be evil. Because it's that comes right out of the fall of man, but this it could be. This is just a passing thought, but it's like okay, what I always want to understand things. Why? Why was there no invasion? Again, it might have just been it was about to be discovered and use it anyway, or use it or lose it. But that just breeds more international contempt. They don't seem to care anymore. Netanyahu's purpose seems to be to destroy his own people. This is not unique in Israeli history. You go back to 70 AD and 135 AD. Same kind of madness. Self-destructive madness. But the army doesn't want this. They would have motive and opportunity to sabotage Netanyahu's plan. See, Netanyahu doesn't have direct control of the military either. That's Gallant. Oh, that's right. Netanyahu is trying to eliminate Gallant, too. The the Minister of Defense, whatever his title is there. Trying to get him fired. Hmm. Connect the dots. Connect the dots. Will there be a coup in Israel? Could you have the Israeli military in direct combat with Netanyahu and the crazy settlers of uh, Gavir? All the settlers he armed with American supplied weapons. You know, during the uh, the the. I was going to say Russian, <laughs> the 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 Rome the the Rome siege of of Jerusalem in seventy A.D. More Jews died 
as a result of infighting among the various factions in the city than were actually killed by the Romans. Many more. In fact, one of the factions deliberately set fire to their food supply when they're under siege. Crazy. Absolutely insane. And Jesus warned of those days. See, this, was, this is the darkness that comes when you reject the light. Israel continues to reject the light. The light is Christ. He's the only light. He is the only way. He is truth. He is love and mercy. He is all that is good. And the only way to God. Because he is both man and God. All right, so I just, I don't know. I'll have to go back and check and see if things change. But if this could be internal Israeli infighting, that does make sense. It does connect the dots. Just remember, you can connect the dots in the wrong way, too. So I give no, uh, I am not claiming uh, papal infallibility, <laughs> which would be. Uh, we, apparently, with people that claim things like that, they just get everything wrong. So this is a mad, 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 mad world. Wasn't there a movie by that name? Yeah, there was. Um, but crazy. Crazy. The only thing that's not crazy is Jesus Christ. That's where you need to be, in his arms. Yeah, find, your, find yourself in Christ. The only place for a square peg in a world full of round holes because his kingdom is bigger, and he's coming to claim this earth anyway. It's his property. He made it, and he purchased it on that cross, too. <sighs> he's the only one worth living for, and certainly the only one worth dying for. Everything else is dust. <laughs>